Okay, um, so hello everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you for attending the talk today. Uh, my name is Sandesh Mysore Anand. I am a, a senior engineering manager uh, at the security team at Razorpay. Uh, I'm joined today with Sitaki uh, uh, Samyan. Uh, he's a senior security engineer uh, at Razorpay as well. Um, you know, we both have been uh, working, we, wo we both work uh, as part of the Razorpay security team. And, you know, we've been working on, on, on many different initiatives. And, and, and today we kind of want to talk about, um, you know, how we built a uh, automated software set inventory um, to answer some key security questions. Um, very often, um, uh, you know, we uh, in the security industry, we kind of use gut feel and, and tribal knowledge to kind of make decision, decisions. Uh, but as we scaled, uh, we, we figured that, you know, we needed a more uh, a, we needed an approach which relies more on data than on just um, tribal knowledge. So that's kind of, uh, you know, what we'll talk about today. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, I'll just a quick recap of what we do. Um, Razorpay, I mean, as probably all, all of you know, is a fintech company. Um, you know, we we offer a lot of payments and banking suite solutions. Uh, but but from from uh, from the perspective of this this talk, I think what's important to know uh, is that Razorpay really believes in a tech first approach to solving even finance problems. Uh, which means that um, you know we we look at um, you know how we can solve problems using technology, whether they're internal or external problems, right? So that culture really helps us you know build build such solutions. Um, and, and you know um, why is security important for Razorpay? Just look at the list, right? So I mean, uh, we, we power many, many of the largest companies and the most important startups um, uh, in India. So obviously, um, security is of primary importance to us. And whatever we can do to make our security process um, and, and program more efficient, um, that's really helpful. And, and and you know that's one of the motivations behind um, working on this project as well. Um, finally, the one um, the one the one aspect that I want all of you to appreciate is that over the last two or three years. I know we've grown in every measure possible, uh, whether it's number of engineers or number of microservices or number of deployments. As you can see, uh, we have kind of uh, been growing very, very fast. So keeping up with growth is important. Um, you know, what works for a small company with 50 engineers does not work uh, for a company with say 500 engineers. And we've been growing at that scale, um, you know, very, very quickly, right? So whatever solutions we build, whatever program we build, it needs to kind of cater to this kind of, kind of scale. And, and and what we're going to talk today uh, talk about today is definitely relevant, uh, you know, to companies which which are scaling quickly and need to scale their um, security program as well. Okay, so let's let's dive into the talk, right? So I, I mean, before we kind of talk about the solution and things, uh, I, I think um, you know the reason we build this inventory is basically to answer some common security questions. So I want to talk through a few questions which you know come across with any security program all the time, right? Um, so first of all, uh, incident response, right? So no matter what size company you are, you will have to deal with security incidents, right? And when you do, um, having a um, robust security incident response program is important. So let's take an example of Log4j, right? So we had the Log4, um, in the Log4 shell issue, uh, I think last December. And the idea was it happened so quickly that within, you know, within a few hours, it went from, hey, what is, there's this new bug um, to getting attack traffic. And this happened to pretty much every company in the world, right? And when that happened, um, you know, it is very useful to have some information, right? Uh, quickly at your fingertips. So for instance, um, you know, if let's say you, you, you got an alert on, on a particular subdomain, right? Um, and and you, you know that this particular subdomain is under attack. Now you want to kind of very quickly figure out, hey, which application teams uh, should we reach out to, right? So if you have a way of answering the question, hey, what applications are deployed on this subdomain, who the owner is and what kind of data it stores, then it makes your life much simpler and you know whom to contact and you can kind of gauge what the impact may be if things go wrong. Right. So um, responding quickly to incidents is really important. Um, having solid data is very important to responding quickly. Now, let's take another example. Right. Um, companies like us are product, uh, product companies. So, you know, our applications, our products are really important from a security perspective. Um, you know, and, and we routinely, uh, you know, we have an we have an AppSec program where one of the one of the things we do is routinely review our AppSec uh, applications for security. Right. Now, when we do that, it's it's really useful uh, to kind of have all the security relevant information about that application, um, you know, upfront. Right. So we can make decisions on how to review the security posture of a given application. So it's very useful to know, um, you know, what are the different infrastructure components an application uses? Um, you know, does the application use any vulnerable third party libraries? Um, is it onboarded into our um, you know, SDLC security tools? Uh, we use a bunch of tools like SEMgrep, Dependabot, and others. So, you know, does the application already use it or is it using it right? Having those information being available in an automated fashion makes a huge difference. So finally, um, you know, metrics, right? So when you, so the, the, so the first one, the incident response stuff is most useful to the security team and the incident team. The second one is useful to the security team, but also to let's say an engineering manager who wants to know how secure their application is. 
Uh, but very often, you know, uh, it, whether it's, uh, you know, like BU leadership or uh, engineering leadership teams, they kind of want to get a sense of where we are as a company, right? Um, they want to get a sense of, you know, how many of our applications are considered high risk, or, you know, what percentage of our attack surface has not been tested from a security perspective, let's say for the last six months. So these are the kind of data points that, you know, we, we often present um, uh, to management or, you know, in general, to even, even to ourselves to kind of know the health of the program, right? Um, and again, these are the kind of questions which are, uh, um, you know, really important from a metrics perspective. So having an up-to-date up -to -date software set inventory uh, can help answer all these questions really, really quickly, right? And with correct up-to-date data. So that's great. So what's the problem, right? So the problem is that you know, uh, in most companies that I've seen, I mean, you know, I, I I used to be in consulting before I kind of took this job up, and I still see many different security programs. And you know, the favorite asset inventory tracking tool of choice for many people yeah, are spreadsheets. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I I love Excel. I feel like most problems in the world can be solved using Excel, uh, but there are some limitations, especially in this case, right? So first, uh, you know, when you track these assets in a spreadsheet, um, it needs constant manual intervention. Uh, where you need someone to actually go and edit, uh, enter the information, right? Um, it's very hard to kind of, you know, it's not very automation, automation friendly from that perspective. Um, it's always out of date, right? In a company like ours, like I said, when we have dozens of deployments every day, every inventory that you filled out manually yesterday is out of date, you know, a few minutes after you filled it out, right? So you always, you know, having an up-to-date inventory becomes very difficult when, when the only way you collect data is through spreadsheets. Um, it's prone to human error, right? When you have humans entering information, human errors happen. Now, I'm not saying we can, any system can be completely uh, void of human errors, but we got to reduce it, right? And, and this, this approach does not. And finally, as your company scales, uh, as your program scales, you have so many spreadsheets, you essentially need a spreadsheet with that spreadsheet. And that's kind of when you know you can have gone too far, right? Um, so yeah, so this is the problem. To be honest, this is exactly how we started as well. Uh, in 2019 and uh, 2020, when we kind of were looking at it, we definitely had like a bunch of spreadsheets with a list of applications and everything there. And it kind of worked for a bit. And at some point, it just stopped scaling, right? And that's when uh, we felt like we needed an intervention. So uh, before I hand over to Satyaki, I just want to, at a high level, talk about kind of how we thought about the solution, right? So, um, you know, from the last two slides, it's very clear what the requirements were, right? So we needed something automated, we needed something uh, up to date, and we needed something on demand, right? So when we were looking at uh, different options, we found a tool uh, from Lyft called Cartography. This is an open source solution, uh, solution that they have open source, which essentially connects to different sources of data and kind of dumps it all into a new 4J database and then lets us do stuff with it. So this was a great starting point. We were very excited when we saw this. You know, we kind of initially played around with it in our laptops and see how it works and, and with our stage environment. And that kind of gave us the confidence that you know we can we can probably make this work. Um, very quickly we realized that you know we won't be able to use it out of the box and get all our answers and we had to make a bunch of changes and we had to also make it um you know work for all our um, teams as well. So it's not just something that security consumes, but also other teams consume it. So we needed to make sure that it, it, it's usable for you know every team that needs to use it. So um, that's kind of how we got started. Now, let me take a pause here and hand this over to Satyaki, who will tell, tell you a little bit more about the nuts and bolts implementation uh, of, of how we went from kind of playing around with Lyft to kind of having like a full-fledged um, uh, software set inventory. Um, Satyaki, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandesh. Uh, before I walk you uh, all through the presentation, uh, although Sandesh mentioned, let me, uh, I mean, try to uh, make you understand why asset inventory is required uh, by taking an example uh, that you all might be familiar with. So let's say you, uh, we all invest in a variety of things like mutual funds and stocks and crypto and so on. So how do we manage all these different kind of investments done on completely different platforms and uh, mitigate market risk? Uh, we cannot only rely on memory, right? Hence, we write down our assets uh, so that we remember our investments every time we take a look. Similarly, asset inventory helps the organization remember all of its assets uh, it has procured over the years. Uh, maybe uh, that subdomain which uh, was procured a few years ago and it's now lying idle. So asset inventory basically prevents an asset from becoming a liability and helps uh, the security protect uh, Razor Bay better. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, though we gather most of our information in an automated fashion, uh, there are just some information which uh, we need manual intervention for, like contact details, for example, uh, or documentation links, or tech specs, or ownership information. All uh, uh, these data is a little hard to get uh, in an automated way. So uh, entering also entering these data manually is hard, right? Uh, 
so we came uh, up with a program uh, we made a product that supports uh, uh, i mean that supports the developers so uh, we came up with the idea of application manifest which is a yaml file where developers can put in all the necessary details uh, as you can see on the slide right now uh, no one likes to do extra work and uh, we predicted no developer will uh, fill up the manifest even though it hardly takes 5 minutes to fill it up right hence we enforced it on all the repositories and if you want to create a repository in jsp you first have to create a application manifest moving on to the next slide uh, let's let's talk about the fun part how did we manage to map uh, different components of different services like aws and github and jira together to understand that uh, let me quickly uh, walk you through how we deploy uh, a code in jsp so first of all we store the code in github secondly github actions access ci and builds the code thirdly the code is stored as build images in harbor then uh, spinnaker is used as cd and delivers the build to kubernetes and kubernetes is the place where uh, the deployment happens so basically how we did it is we scanned all of the above mentioned technologies and connected the dots uh, the entire process is uh, automated and engineers uh, at razorway follow strict naming conventions uh, which helped us successfully map uh, all the repositories back to their uh, deployed containers this mapping is necessary to derive critical insights like for example if you want to know uh, which iam role is being used by your kubernetes container of a certain github repository uh, this is this is one way where you can get that information in seconds through our uh, own automated asset inventory moving on to the next slide uh lifts original cartography module was great and it helped us achieve our goal much faster than we thought but it didn't work for all of our use cases we had to build some intels and uh, modify uh, the existing ones for example we needed to connect jira tickets back to the applications right and jira wasn't available so we had to write an intel for jira similarly uh, for github uh, it we needed more than uh, what cartography originally offered right so uh, let me give you an example we modified the github intel uh, to read depend about results and scan sift for each and every repository so that we can create s bombs for uh, every repository so this is how we modified uh, intels and uh, wrote our own intels to uh, reach where we are today moving on to the next slide uh, we used neo 4j uh, we used neo4j as our data lake uh, neo4j is a graph database and exactly what we needed to gather insight so let me show you how it works let's say you have to name an s3 bucket uh, you have to map an s3 bucket back to the repository it is connected to so first of all you list down all the s3 buckets that are there and you choose your uh, s3 bucket that you want to uh, search for then you write the name of the s3 bucket there and do a search again so that will uh, like shortlist that specific s3 bucket you are looking for now s3 buckets are connected to aws iam roles right so you find out which iam roles uh, this s3 bucket is connected to uh, trying to do that uh, it will return you all the iam roles this specific s3 bucket is connected to as you can see now iam roles are connected to cube manifest templates now every repository in razor pay has a cube manifest template so that it is deployed into kubernetes so we shortlist the cube manifest that this iam these iam roles are attached to uh trying to do that uh, it will uh, i mean give you the exact cube manifest templates this s3 bucket is uh, connected to and now the cube manifest templates are directly re uh, related to github repositories so uh, when you uh, try to link the cube manifest template back to the github repository you will get those repositories that this s3 bucket is originally connected to which is colored in sky blue as you can see correct so uh, although neo4j is extremely powerful and has a beautiful ui it isn't for everyone since it has a learning curve hence we push our insight uh, to a different platform called looker moving on to the next slide we chose looker uh, since looker is razor pay's bi tool of choice and most of the company knows how to use it hence there's no learning curve that is required the specific dashboard gives us an overview of the company 
and is used by business owners, engineering leaderships, and of course, security. It will provide this dashboard provides you with key insights like risk ranking of an application, which is determined by an in-house algorithm. This algorithm works by taking into account multiple parameters and not just with tribal knowledge. So uh, this is how uh, dynamic uh, we have tried to create the entire process. Moving on to the next slide. While the previous dashboard gave us an overview of where we stand as a company, this one gives you an in-depth in in information about any application that you choose. So we, the focus was not uh, on fancy graphs, but on answering specific questions, which helps the security team uh, make decisions based on intelligence, right? In this case, uh, we were able to get information about all the applications into one place. So any application you type, you get all the information that is related to it. This makes uh, life easier for pen testers and incident response teams. And whenever there is a crucial vulnerability or a serious error, uh, in no time you can directly reach out to the uh, team owners or the application owners and get the issue resolved. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, and before I hand over the mic to Sandesh, I just wanted to mention a couple of factors that helped us uh, get this, this, uh, this project done. Uh, specifically, the fact that the deployment pipeline was automated from day one, which meant that we were able to pull all the information in an automated fashion. Secondly, uh, from the time that we were a small company, Reservoir did a great job with naming conventions and other uh, best practices. This made it very simple to map applications across multiple uh, resources. When we pushed the application manifest, uh, I mean, the application manifest program, instead of getting uh, pushbacks uh, for, for the program, we actually were supported by different uh, teams and different BUs. And uh, if you are building an inventory and in your company and these factors uh, does not apply to you, you may have to modify the program that suits your needs. So uh, saying this, I hand over the uh, mic to Sandesh and uh, Sandesh, you can uh, take, take this on. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Satyaki. So yeah, like like Satyaki mentioned, um, you know, there were a bunch of engineering practices, you know, which predates this project, which kind of really helped us kind of get there. Um, the whole automation first, um, um, you know, uh, culture in Asia itself is very, very useful, right? Uh, and, and very conducive for such projects. So if, if a, anyone listening kind of wants to build a program like this, um, do keep this in mind. You may have to account for your company's cultural preferences, your company's processes, um, you know, and, and modify what, whatever we are saying to kind of suit that and then go ahead and, and, and kind of build the inventory. Okay, so um, so I, I think I know Satyaki did a great job at kind of giving you the uh, the lowdown on uh, you know all the different aspects um, of how we kind of build this tool. So let's kind of circle back to kind of the original questions we were asking at the beginning uh, of the talk, right? So the one key question we asked was, hey, you know what AWS services does an application use? So if you look at this um, quick video, right? So this is um, like a quick screen grab of our Looker dashboard. So essentially, what happens here is that if you have an application and you kind of enter the name of the application here, um, right, it will give you a list of all the infrastructure components which are uh, mapped to that particular application. So the number of Kubernetes services deployed, the number of, um, you know, um, and, uh, the active pods and so on and so forth. So this gives, I, I, so at a quick glance, you're able to kind of figure out, you know, what kind of infrastructure this app, uh, this application uses. Very useful during security assessments, uh, very useful during um, incident management as well. Um, so moving on, um, you know, uh, we kind of spoke about uh, kind of subdomain enumeration as well a, a little bit earlier, but in general, like you know, if you have a subdomain or if you have like a bug bounty report where, where somebody reported a bug on a particular subdomain, right? You don't know what it maps back to, right? So what what uh, you know? So we built like a very simple interface which basically maps um, applications to infra components or, or rather other, 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 infra components to applications. And what you can see here is basically that you know we have a list of all our Route 53 subdomains mapped to different applications. And then you can basically pick a particular name. So in this case, I'm, I'm showing you, um, you know, kind of a company often that we acquired a couple of years ago. I want to know all the subdomains and often, I know which applications they're mapped to. I can see that in, in like a single second, right? It takes, it takes me less than 30 seconds to get all that information. And I also have the contact information that I can go contact. Um, another example, right? Um, what applications have access to an AWS service, right? So let's say there's a, there's a critical AWS uh, S3 bucket or, or in, in general, just an S3 bucket and you want to know which are the different applications who have access to it. Now, um, this is in, in general, a critical thing, right? I mean, you know, um, um, if, when your application has access to write, an S3, the write to an S3 bucket, and then if let's say if that application gets hacked, that essentially means your kind of um, your S3 bucket or your AWS infra is in trouble, right? So in general, you want to follow, um, you know, 
uh, principle of least privileges and make sure that a given application only has access to buckets that it requires. So when you're doing an assessment and you, the first thing you do is go look at, you know, what components an application has access to. And if it has, if it has access, if that application has access to components it shouldn't have, then that's a red flag, right? That's a, that's, that's, that's a um, you know, that, that's a signal for us to saying, hey, let's go digging a little bit further and try and figure out what's going on, here, right? So like you can see, um, you know, it does not always tell you exactly what's going on, but it gives you important nuggets of information, which would have otherwise taken you hours or days to figure out, right? And it gives, that, gives you all of that in kind of a click of a button. Um, so the final kind of question that I want to kind of show you how we answer um, is on, you know, SBOM. SBOM is kind of the, um, uh, kind of the hot topic of the day, right? Thanks to Log4j and a bunch of other open source issues. So essentially what we did was we, we connected our inventory uh, to our SBOM. Um, and if you put in the name of a library here, um, uh, so actually let me walk through this example a little more slowly, right? So within, within um, Razorpay, there are two different ways of kind of doing logging. Uh, right. Um, so one is using um, you know Uber's um, Zap library, which kind of helps you with the logging framework, and we also have an internal logger that um, you know uh, that we wrote uh, as part of our um, Go Utils package. Right. So what we want to do is sometimes, right? Um, like for example, let's say the security team writes a library uh, to perform secure logging. Okay, I'm just giving an example here, and you want to kind of figure out how good the adoption is. Right. So this gives you a really good idea because what you can do is you can put that. Yeah, you you, you can see. Uh, you can basically add that dependency here and, and, and make it part of the SBOM and then see how many applications are using it. So here, what I'm doing is I'm clicking Zap and then seeing who all are using Zap here, right? And then you get a list of, uh, I think, yeah. So we used is instead of contains, so we use contains and then um, go run that query again. And then essentially what you get is a list of all the applications which use Zap now. So, you know, here are the list of 40 application teams you may have to convince to try to say, hey, why don't you move to the latest version of Logger that we've written here, all the uh, advantages, right? So in addition to all the, Security implications of that an SBOM gives you, like for example, looking for um, you know insecure libraries, uh, usage of insecure libraries. It also helps you drive adoption, um, you know, for 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 particular practices. Um, so yeah, so these are some of the key questions that we spoke about earlier in the presentation that we can answer um, now in an automated fashion um, at, at pretty much a click of a button. Um, and and you know we 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 are very happy with where we are, and and, and you know, uh, but we also feel like we're just getting started, right? Um, so what else can we do, right? Um, so you know we we want to kind of integrate um, you know what we have today with with more observability tools, uh, right? Um, like you know like you know like link it with API inventories and also risk rank applications based on volume of traffic. So today we we base it on static uh, uh, static questions like you know what kind of data it handles is it internal versus external and so on and so forth. But you know you're gonna have two different external applications um, with which both handle similar kinds of data, uh, but one is used. Um, by millions of people, and the other one is used, you know, a few times a week, right? Uh, the risk ranking for that for the for both applications should not be the same, right? So we want to be a little more dynamic with our risk ranking, and that can happen if we can integrate, um, you know, more information about, um, you know, traffic data into um into, into our inventory. Um, secondly, you know, we love Looker dashboards. Like Satyak you mentioned, Looker is used across the company, so it, you know, it's it's pretty easy for people to pick up and understand what's going on. Uh, it also makes life very easy for um, like an analytics team or an engineering team to go, um, you know, get answers to questions. But but the one issue is that you know if you want to build a local dashboard, then you got to first start with a question and then answer that question using the local dashboard, right? Um, it doesn't allow you to kind of like find new insights. So so when when Satyaki was showing you a demo uh, of the of Neo4j. Um, you know, new version is like a really cool interface to kind of just like explore, right? Like enter the name of an S3 bucket, see kind of, you know, um, what components are there. And then you say, hmm, this is interesting. And then click on that. And then kind of, you know, just, just use your um, security mindset to kind of try and find new relationships and see what's going on and see if there are any security issues there. Um, having said that, new 4 j is super nerdy and very hard for to use for people. Right? The learning curve is massive. So we kind of want something between a static looker dashboard, uh, which which only answers specific questions, and Neo4j, which is super nerdy and kind of hard to use. So, oh, sorry about that. Okay, so we kind of try to um, you know figure out if, if if we can if we can find the UI um, for for that, uh, for our asset inventory, which can kind of uh, be somewhere in the middle, right? So that that would be really cool as well. And that kind of ties into the next one as well is that you know. Um, Software asset inventories are not useful just for security. In fact, I would say security is maybe one of four or five different functions for which inventory may be useful, right? Um, our DevOps time teams will, will find it very useful. Uh, from an observability perspective, it's very useful kind of to have everything in one place. Um, also to measure their productivity, right? Um, right now, we're kind of looking more at the app to infra mapping to figure things out, but you can just get so many insights from GitHub you know, or, or, or how, how our developers write code to kind of figure out how productive our developers are, you know, what are the areas they need support in to improve productivity, 
um, you know, how many errors are we getting, um, let's say, in, in, in your CI pipeline and so on and so forth, right? Again, things not relevant to security, but very useful to the company. So, uh, you know, our, our, our goal is now to kind of, um, you know, invite collaborators from outside the security team and see how else, uh, you know, the inventory can be used um, there as well. Okay, so um, in summary, right, uh, just to kind of quickly uh, tie together everything you spoke about, um, we cannot protect what we don't know exists, right? So if you don't have a good idea of how many applications we have, how many subdomains we have, how they map to each other, uh, what kind of components, infra components are used, then it's hard as security team to protect it, right? So we need to know what we own, we need to understand our attack surface. And um, as, as as companies grow, it's very difficult to maintain such in, such an inventory manually, right? So you need kind of um, uh, you need kind of automation to do that. Um, and 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 while there are many inventory tools within a cloud provider, let's say like AWS, uh, you need something which talks to all of your different systems, right? And that's where tools like Cartography can be a great starting point to connect different data sources. Uh, by no means is Cartography the only tool. This is the tool that we use. There are plenty of others, paid and free, open source, uh, which can be used to do similar work. Um, next, I think uh, in summary for us, this was this was a big learning lesson was for for us was to minimize minimize reliance on manual data entry, uh, make it easy to enter and update data. Nobody likes filling forms, we all know that. But how do we make it easy? How do we make it relevant? And how do we make sure it's up to date? Right. So that's something that we, we again uh, that we learned through this process. Uh, finally, um, you know, if you want to deliver insights and you want the org to use it, um, you know, um, make sure you take your insights to a tool that they use. Right. So that way, um, adoption is a lot faster. Um, they see results pretty in a, in a comfortable uh, location as opposed to like a PDF report, which is 50 pages long. Um, finally, um, make security decisions based on data and not just gut feel. Uh, this is kind of why we started this whole project. Um, you know, um, you know, we, we felt like when, when we were a smaller company, it was easy to easy to do uh, to kind of make decisions on gut feel. Um, if you have to pick like five assessments to pen test, right? Uh, to take a step back, right? Ideally, we would like to do, do all kinds of security activities on all kinds of applications and all aspects of our infrastructure. But the reality is that every security team is uh, is limited by the amount of time and budget and manpower we have, right? So the resources we have, we need to use it well, right? And and to do that, we kind of want to make such decisions based on data and not just on that piece, right? So that ensures that our security posture is good and at the same time that we're using our resources in the right place. So yeah, so this is in summary of, of what we have done. Um, you know, you can you can reach out to um, uh, me on Twitter or I'm, I'm at Juba on Jeans, or you can reach out to Satyaki or who's on LinkedIn as well. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to collaborate, or um, you know, if you want to uh, if you want to do this in your organization and you have questions for us, please feel free to reach out. Hey, thank you for the session. It was very very insightful. Um, a lot of learnings. I think uh, we've been trying to do a couple of such things in in uh, my organization also. Um, and it is it's very, very insightful. Thank you for that. Uh, I was actually making some notes while I was listening to the session. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I think uh, audience also, if you have any questions, you can type in on chat, um, uh, we'll take it up. Till then, I think I have a couple of questions for you guys. Um, and so first question, when we were talking about AppSec, right? Specifically third party and using some of the open source tools, which you named a couple of them, which is like Dependabot or, or SEMDREP, right? Mm -hmm. And you started your presentation with the term called scale, which at which RazorPay works, right? Now, all these open source tools, um, usually they don't support uh, a greater extent of a scale, right? If you have to run some parallel scans of SEMDREP, we don't know how does it behave, right? These yeah. tools, specifically non-commercial tools, they don't uh, look at scale altogether. How do you deal with it? Yeah, no, that's a, that, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's a really good question, right? So I think I mean to me, um, SEMGREP is kind of the odd one out because it actually scales really well, uh, right? Yeah. So, uh, but but in general, you're right. I mean, you know, whether it's tools like Dependabot or others, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, SEMGREP and the reason we chose these two tools is because they integrate really well with our um, with our CI pipeline, right? So mm -hmm. with GitHub Actions, they they they're supported out of the box, and, and with SEMGREP, we we've, we've kind of started out by using the open source uh, free version, but we kind of moved on to kind of um, you know work with their commercial product as well. So that kind of helped uh, get some scale for static analysis. But Dependabot. Um, it, it, it's 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 been an interesting journey, uh, right? Uh, it, it helps that given we given Dependabot's kind of part of the GitHub ecosystem, uh, it just works very very well, um, you know, with GitHub. But I, I I will say this that you know you're 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 absolutely right about um, you know the effectiveness and some of the feature richness that doesn't exist, right? So very often we'll have to do things to make these tools more usable. So for example, um, you know, for Dependabot, I know it's really hard for developers to kind of look at results um, in, in GitHub itself. It actually, you know, you don't you don't get um, you don't get data at a high level. Like if you want 
if you want like a um, you know like let's let's say you're an engineering manager and you have like 10 different uh, products under you you want to get a summary of everything it's literally very very hard to get that independent about so what we did was we kind of um, took another open source project uh, defect dojo and we kind of poked that and we built something called bhadra internally uh, the, maybe this is topic for another talk but defect dojo does not scale it just doesn't right it, it, it's built for like um, fun projects for like five people so we kind of decomposed uh, uh, defect dojo uh, and kind of like um, you know make sure that uh, we kind of uh, scale the infrastructure so now what we do is we kind of pipe all results from depend about also into but what we call bhadra but effectively scaled defect dojo right so there um, it's easier for um, you know uh, execs and 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 managers to kind of go look at their status so all of them have depend about all the tools that we use you have a single vulnerability management dashboard there and if developers are uh, want to look at the actual uh, issue in code then they can go look at it, look for it in github uh, which depend about does a good job of because it was built for developers not for security teams or for managers right so you're right i think i i, I think the the advantage we have with open source tools is that it allows you to start very quickly uh, and get something going very quickly uh, but not all tools are built for scale uh, and when we encounter that we don't really have an option but to kind of try something more commercial right um but but i, but I, but I do think semgrep is a bit of an exception because uh, you know it was built very recently and i know it was built by people who have uh, used all the other tools and kind of <laughs> failed uh, to scale right so i think semgrep is a bit of an exception Great. So my next question will be: When we talked about vulnerability management, um, it, it somehow links with the asset, asset inventory also, because mm -hmm. whenever we create asset inventory, we we tend to do some checks and analysis on top of all these assets uh, on a regular basis, regression or if the the moment we figure out there's a new asset, we try and run some test cases on that, right? So, how do you map um, your vulnerability management tool or your asset inventory to respective teams and owners? right that becomes a very important question because it's very very important when you have a vulnerability how do you know who to reach out to it might yeah. be linked to a github, github repo or it might be a domain subdomain where there's a default admin page or there's a cms or there's a bug in a mobile application these are all assets right so yeah. how do you map it to a person and how do you make sure the role based access because i'm not sure if defect dojo i think it supports but how do you how do you basically configure defect dojo or the bhadra tool which you have basically scaled up how do you make sure the specific vulnerabilities are only for certain set of people people but not everyone in the org can see them yeah yeah no that's a good question right so i, I think there are a few things which i mean first of all this is a work in progress right i don't think we've kind of hit um, the ideal state that we want to be in right so we're still kind of in the building process there um i think at this point uh, again there's a piece engineering culture really helps here right um so the focus for this talk is on applications that we have built not on cots applications like third party applications that's a slightly different story and the process for that is very different right um so for example if there's a bug in our jira instance then it's not treated using the inventory we use something else for it but for applications we build what essentially happens is that um uh the repository where the code is stored which is in in a microservice is map one is to one to a deployed application sometimes there's like a one is to two mapping or one is to three mapping but by and large it's a one to one map right and and like satyaki explained earlier right we created something called manifests which is the only manual portion of this entire exercise where for every repository we had a manifest file uh, which is basically a yaml file uh, something developers enjoy writing as opposed to spreadsheets uh, right so we basically created a template and made sure that every repository has these manifests right so every repository has like owner information slack threads etc cetera, etc cetera, um slack channels with they with, where they coordinate or email list etc right and since we can map repositories to subdomains to deployments uh, if i find a bug in an application which is on, on you know we get a bug bounty report for a subdomain right um i can map that back to a repo and for the repo i have a manifest which has the contact information right so sure. that's kind of how i can within a couple of clicks go ahead and find who is responsible for it uh, and then we track any production issues we have on jira so we have like a very clear demarcation between issues we found in production versus issues we found in sdlc which is basically in any branch before master so those are tracked in dojo but uh, in jira we have um, you know we, we kind of track production issues and and there of course we can use the tools uh, the, the features that jira gives us uh, to kind of mask some of the details um, we use a couple of interesting hacks for, to kind of do the rbac stuff um so what we do is you know the details of the ticket themselves may not make it to jira that will stay in a google drive which is which has much better rbac uh, you know where we can actually uh, kind of make sure it be exposed to a team so yeah the, so the rbac piece i would say there, there's there's room for improvement on how we do it uh, the way we do it right now is pretty hacky right? but it works
uh, but maybe in the future, yeah. I mean, especially for open vulnerabilities and stuff, uh, you know, use a combination of private channels, private Slack channels, and um, Google Docs, uh, heavily restricted Google Docs to put the details in, and only the tracking information is available in Jira. Uh, but we're also a big proponents of learning from our own mistakes. So if there are tickets which are fixed and everything is done and the risk doesn't exist anymore, then we really want to talk about it. We want to talk about it in trainings. We want to make it internally available for people to read and learn from, right? So we try to give as much information as possible as long as it's not an active call. Very interesting to see Google Drive being used for RBAC. Um, I would love <laughs> well, to explore that option. <laughs> I mean, not, not to hack not, you not, one, not, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hack. I mean, not, not so much as RBAC, but to make sure the details are in one place and it's easy to manage who has access to it, right? So. Sure, I think we have one question in the chat. Uh, it's from Saurabh. Um, the, it is two parts to it. First is how many items are present in this system? Uh, I'm not yeah. sure if you got the questions, how many items? Uh, yeah, it probably means like how many tuples, yeah. how many pieces of uh, rows of information in the entire system. I don't know so, if I have the answer to that. I'll, uh, that's a really good question. That question. I'll, I'll yeah. take off the question. So um, we we connect almost everything to everything, right? So uh, let's uh, uh, the, the last question that you are talking about. How do we map a vulnerability back to a person, a specific team? So we we did that in a manual process, but we eventually did it. So uh, it's like we have multiple systems. So we we have. I mean, if you uh, kind of talk about rows, it will be like in millions, the number of rows that we have. But that, for that reason, uh, I see the second question is how is it connected? Is it a tree or a graph? So it's a graph. So for that same reason, we have limited the number of storages that we, the, the storage that we use, right, in database. So we have used a graph database for the same reason. Uh, so there are multiple components, like every Jira ticket is a, comp I mean, if you're asking about the items, right, every Jira ticket is an item or every AWS S3 bucket is an item, every IAM role is an item, every GitHub repository is an item. So we have around millions of uh, such such items which are connected, interconnected uh, with each other via graphs, right? So uh, that is how uh, we do it. Uh, that's how we save storage. And uh, we, we ensure that uh, we give the information. I mean, we can find information really fast. Yeah, would be a cool exercise to get a precise number. That'd be fun uh, to actually get the exact number of rows. I, I, we've, <laughs> that's a good question. Tara, by the way. We didn't think about getting the exact number. But I think that the, the important part there is um, a lot of the magic and the heavy lifting is done by cartography. Right, so we didn't have to actually uh, kind of worry about how big the database is and all that. Uh, eventually, uh, all we had to do was kind of write the right intels, and then um, you know, cartography did a lot of the magic, and then we focused on what we are good at, which is figuring out what security questions need to be answered. Right, so that's what that's what we that's where we spent most of our time. Sure, we'll wait for some more questions. Uh, till then, I think uh, I have a couple of more more. Um, okay. So you talked about APIs again being assets. That's that's work in progress. Any anything we can share in that sense right now? Yeah. Look, so look, like I said, you know, we are we are we are kind of moving to a microservices first architecture, right? So most of our applications, you know, are microservices. And um, if you understand how Razorpay works, a lot of merchants integrate with us, right? Um, so there are some no-code products, there are some products which are like web applications, but a lot of our, you know highly scaled products are basically API integrations, right? Um, so obviously API security is really important for us. Um, the one area where I said, you know, we want to improve is that, you know, when we when we figure out how risky a particular API endpoint is, uh, we use various measures to, various, various parameters to kind of figure that out, right? Um, you know, what kind of sensitive data is it using? Does it, you know, is it involved in making a financial transaction? Um, I, you know, is it is it external facing or is it an API endpoint which is used just by two internal microservices and so on and so forth? So those things are pretty straightforward. It's already done. Um, what we need to probably also consider is things like, hey, um, you know, what is the impact if it goes down? Um, you know, how many users use it at a given time? Right, a, a, a API endpoint which sees like a hundred RPS is way more valuable to us or, or has a higher impact if it goes down from an availability perspective as opposed to something which sees like one RPS or you know has you know is been is used by some obscure <laughs> merchant three times a month right so i think that level of information we still don't have in our inventory uh, once we get that i think we can use that as well uh, we, we're kind of working on that we're trying to work on uh, observability systems which will give us that data and then use that as well we have the observability systems but we don't we don't have it linked to um uh, uh, linked to the inventory uh, so when that happens i think hopefully we can drive some more insights right because to me in the end um, I have a limited team uh, and limited budget, and limited time, right? We want to kind of use it on the right resources, on the right assets, right? And and using, um, you know, getting this data will allow me to kind of, um, you know, spend time on the important assets and not treat every endpoint as the same. 
right? I would have loved to kind of do the same amount of assessments on everything, but <laughs> reality is that we can't do that. I can totally understand this. Um, yeah. Talking about third-party integrations, uh, Sandesh or Satyaki, anyone if you answer this, but the question is, how do you exactly deal with it? For you guys specifically being a payment gateway or or uh, multiple of the payment services, uh, there'll be there'll be thousands. I'm not sure of. I cannot even come up with the number. But how do you deal with the security load? So, you you might even give a secure SDK, but it might be some configuration configurations which third party vendor might miss. Do you guys deal with it, or how do you make it by yeah. by default secure? Yeah, that's like a talk on its own. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know if I if I can kind of like give you give you like a complete answer. But you're right, right? I mean, this this is kind of the this is kind of a problem that any B two B modern B two B company or a B2, we're kind of like B two B two C in the sense that you know yeah. it's in in the end the company is also used by consumers. So you're absolutely right. Um, you know the the goal is to kind of whenever we create an integration or we build SDKs, the hope is that you know when uh, that we do whatever it takes to kind of make it hard for people to make security mistakes. In integrations, but then it's 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 impossible to make it uh, you know completely proof, right? I mean that's that's I think that's a given, right? Uh, and and we do integrations on multiple things, right? So merchants integrate with us, but we integrate with our banking partners, we integrate with other um, you know um, uh, acquirers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So the integrations are all over the place, right? And it's it's kind of like second nature to us. So I think we've we've kind of developed some amount of muscle memory on figuring out what works and what doesn't work, um, and and you know we have like checklists and stuff which will help us there. Uh, but honestly, it's 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 a constant kind of like a cat and mouse game, right? So uh, we'll have to keep upgrading what we do, and without that, <laughs> it's pretty hard uh, to kind of keep up with it. So I I, I I think I mean there's no kind of like silver bullet. It really depends on what kind of integration we're talking about, and and, and the idea is to kind of have like like a secure SDLC where depending on the type of application and type of integrations, you 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 try and threat model it, and then based on that come up with like security checks. I'm making it seem like it all works seamlessly in a perfect manner. It does not, right? It's it's very messy and it's hard to scale. Uh, but you know, like I said, we have, we have we have a lot of experience doing this, and that kind of helps. That that knowledge kind of helps us, um, kind of you know do these things in a secure manner. Great, great. Um, I think um, you guys can again, audience, you can raise your hands or post your questions in the chat. Um, last question from my side, Sandesh and Satyaki, and the question is about: Do you guys rely on any other third party? tool services or a vendor to figure out if there's something left some asset which you have not identified yeah so i i, I think we are uh, so you're talking about like uh, attack surface monitoring tools and this kind of might be shodan or or any other vendor who can provide os information or or asset which is like in public yeah, so I mean, I, I I kind of don't want to go into too much specifics here because things are kind of uh, in a flux and stuff. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, th there are certain things that we do where we leverage and we do like OSINT assessments. Uh, one of the things we do is every time somebody joins us, uh, joins us a new pen tester or part of the security assessment team, their first job is to do OSINT on our on on Razorpay because our point is when you join new, you you kind of you still kind of like an outsider in the sense that you don't have the internal working knowledge. So you look at things from a fresh pair of eyes, right? Um, non-scalable, but, but a fun exercise and, and, and good to kind of get an outside perspective. Um, now we are, I mean, we do use some tools which kind of, uh, we use some OSINT tools internally, which kind of we run on a regular basis to get, get these ideas. Uh, but we are kind of also considering working with vendors who will kind of help us, um, you know, get that information. But in general, attack surface monitoring is something, um, you know, uh, uh, which is really important to us. Um, what works in our favor again is that uh, we are like a single cloud provider. We work with AWS only, um, and that um, you know from day one we've been all on on public cloud, right? So this means that there is um, there is a smaller chance, not a zero chance, but a smaller chance of having shadow IT uh, where people are randomly deploying on something else and you know uh, doing that. So so that gives makes life a little easier, but but definitely something that you know we'll consider. Great. Um, 